clap once for yes. Can you hear me clap twice? Clap, can you hear me clap three times? And that's enough. Ladies and gentlemen, now class, are we ready? Few people have had such influence on the blockchain world as the man we're about to hear from now. Few people. It is as if you're about to witness one of the founding fathers of a new industry appear before you. You will remember where you were on this date and this place. I guarantee you. So please, ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Vitalik Buterin and John Evans from TechRunch. There. I know, it's the whole rock star welcome, I do appreciate it. I don't want to dwell over much in your t-shirt, but I was going to come out here and say how sad I was that you weren't wearing the long form t-shirt. And now you are, so thank you, that makes me very happy. It's my favorite tech conference visual of all time. Uh, you've said that uh, what you want to focus on for Ethereum over the next little while mm -hmm. for uh, scaling mm -hmm. privacy and security. Yes. Are those still what are kind of front of mind for you? I'd say so. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to relitigate scaling. We just talked about it for half an hour. I just had one question that mm -hmm. popped into my head. So people criticize proof of stake on a theoretical level, mm -hmm. the claim that it sort of makes the rich get richer and centralizes influence that way. I take it you don't agree? That's um, definitely, uh, at least I feel, one of the less kind of like good criticisms of proof of stake is like, look at proof of work, right? Like, um, um, Bitmain, uh, Bitmain, uh, Bitmain's two mining pools collectively own something like 43 to 40, uh, something like that percent of all of Bitcoin's hash power. If you add in, I think, via BTC, which is basically kind of affiliated with Bitmain, altogether you have 53%. So you already have this kind of like fairly small mini cartel that has 53%, and that's 53, which is 51% plus two, um, for those who can't add, um, of, the, uh, of, of the Bitcoin network's uh, hash power. And you know, like back in 2013, when Ghash uh, briefly hit 51%, like that was a big, huge scare moment, and everyone really complained a lot. And eventually, you know, like Ghash, uh, so Ghash um, diplomatically uh, backed down and went and voluntarily dropped themselves to 40%. Um, but now, you know, like it's basically happening a second time, and people just aren't really talking as much. And then this time around, right? These um, these aren't just pools, right? Like. Sure, technically there are pools that people can participate in them, but it's basically a plausible deniable, deniability strategy where the, a very large portion of that is just hardware owned by a, a very small number of concentrated actors, including the operators themselves. And from the outside, you can't really tell exactly how much actually is a real pool and how much is just a front for their hardware. So, like first of all, there's clearly incentive, large incentives to hide the real level of centralization and proof of work for like public relations reasons. And Clearly, even despite that, we can tell that the top three, uh, it's like very well coordinated group of pools together has over half of the hash power. And you know, like, we can talk about geographic concentration. So um, a couple of uh, days ago, there was um, that flood in uh, Sichuan in China, and that led to something like 20% of the hash power just suddenly getting knocked offline. So like proof of work is like rich gets richer squared. Right, so if we can get to rich getting richer to the power of one, that's already a substantial improvement. <laughs> All right, let's talk about security for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, ordinary people read headlines about Ethereum hacks and, and wrongly think that Ethereum has been hacked. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's smart contract developers writing mm -hmm. vulnerable or buggy code. Uh, can you talk about what you have in mind to improve the state of affairs there? Um, sure. So. I guess so. Uh, one of the important things there is that we need kind of continued ongoing development of better and more secure programming languages and standards. So, <coughs> um, no, uh, that's great. Um, so one of the uh, examples of this is that like, recently another uh, pro high level programming language, so something that compiles down to EVM code. Um, was released, uh, at least as a beta, called Viper. And uh, Viper is a language that um, was 
designed from the start to be kind of more restrictive and target readability and security more and basically make it harder to screw up and make it harder to write deliberately misleading code. So the design process for Viper basically was you know, like take a kind of Python-like language, add, add a, a much stronger type system, and then look at the biggest you know, like 10 screw-ups in, in Solidity programming history and try to make features that deliberately make those as hard as possible um, or you know, like impossible entirely. And that's been launched, the, 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 that's released as a beta, and that's something that's going to be developing. Um, we, um, I think, gave a, gave a grant to a group that was trying to make a, uh, another high-level language for Ethereum that was based on more kind of functional programming principles. So we are trying, and, and then in Solidity itself, there's been a lot of improvement over the last year or so with uh, you know, like safe math libraries, like, different, like stricter checks and all of those things. So there are kind of multiple prongs of innovation happening on the programming language side that I do think will make uh, writing a lot of these uh, contracts uh, more and more safe over time. Um, another thing that we're doing has to do, uh, uh, or, and wants to do more, has to do with like basically just having good code samples and code templates. So if you want a multi-sig wallet, where do you go? What do you implement? Uh, for components that are that standard, there should just be a standardized versions that have been audited, that have been full, formally verified, that are there ready to use, right? And that's something that's uh, not there yet, but is getting closer and closer to being there. Um, and so I think with better languages, better standards, better uh, like better templates, uh, better defaults, uh, we can get a, um, get to really reducing the yeah, smart contract security issues by a lot. And probably to the point where, at, like, at some point, private key security once again becomes a dominant issue, and that's something that we want to really tackle as well. Yeah. Uh, since you bring up Solidity bugs and multi-sig wallets, um, there's a bunch of money sitting out there in mm -hmm. what Sam called a long-term savings account because uh, of the parity multi-sig lost in limbo. But what do you think is going to happen to that money, ultimately? Well, so the only way that it can ever move, right, is if there, well, there's two ways that it can move. One way is that the Ethereum community agrees on a hard fork to uh, move it, basically do some like, modifications to the contract's code in place or move the money somewhere else so it can be uh, recovered. And like, that continues to be, like, it's totally mathematically possible to do that, but um, at the same time, you know, we saw with EIP 999 and there was, uh, there was that carbon vote which ended up voting against it. There was um, quite a bit of negative get get feedback on the GitHub. So in the short term, it seems like, you know, like there's the, the political will is quite far from uh, being able to actually push, the, uh, push something like that forward. The second way through which something like it can happen is, of course, if someone makes a another blockchain which basically like hard spoons or airdrops or whatever, like all of the Ethereum account balances, but makes the one modification to unlock the wallet. And huh. that's something that's like theoretically totally could happen. And it's like technically one way in which that wallet could become, those funds from that wallet could become usable in some way, you know, like without kind of like compromising the blockchains and the immutability by itself. Yeah. So, like, ultimately it is the community's decision and I want to try really hard to kind of not be, you know, myself be super, like, super heavily involved in influencing that, but, you know, like, you can kind of look at what all of the other people in the community have been, you know, like, uh, saying, you know, like, the opinions that people have been expressing in some of the governance discourse so far and you can kind of see for yourself, you know, like, where, the state of the discussion is at right now, uh, what is the chance that some, uh, it'll end up changing in the future and so forth. Yeah, that leads me to, I wanted to ask about your own role. I mean, right now you're both the sort of celebrity public face and driving force behind the theory and also kind of its chief scientist. Um, and I want to make Carl be the public face. Like, wasn't he <laughs> a great love? Uh, he was right? <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. That was kind of my question. So, who's, uh, who's the Steve Ballmer to your Bill Gates if you retreat back to chief scientists? Like, Carl makes sense. Hmm. I'll admit to not being kind of well versed enough in Microsoft history to know like Steve Ballmer's <laughs> exact role beyond just standing up and going on stage and ranting about developers and something about open source being cancer and whatever. But um, I should probably apologize to Carl for that analogy, actually. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, like, so first of all, like, there's Ian Eagrichi, the executive director for the foundation, who's been doing uh, quite a good job of kind of holding the fort on the administrative side and making sure that the foundation kind of 
keeps on uh, our smoothly rolling and the, uh, the bureaucracy does more good than harm. Um, Do you think you yourself are going to be stepping back a little from? I've been stepping back from like that side for for, for quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously kind of all of the individual team leaders. There's um, a lot of other people, other people kind of on the management side that have been involved in, in organization. There's uh, more and more different uh, different people working on research, different people working on development. Another important difference between the Ethereum Foundation and something like Microsoft is that the Ethereum Foundation tries kind of very hard to be a decentralized organization, and definitely not singling out Microsoft specifically. Right? Pretty much all corporations are centralized organizations, but like in the Ethereum Foundation, right? Like for example, we uh, try very hard not to uh, kind of not to have very hard divides of like you are on the inside, you are on the outside. This is a company party, no one from the outside is allowed, and in, like, you're, you know, in the, this thing is company members only and so forth. Um, like basically, because well, there's multiple ways to interact with the Ethereum community and how to through the Ethereum Foundation, right? Like you can become a full-time contributor, you can apply for a grant, um, and right now the budget of our grant program is larger than the budget of the yeah, Foundation's full-time staff itself. Um, you can um, work for some project in the Ethereum ecosystem, you know, like, like something like Omega Go, and at the same time, just to end up collaborating with Ethereum Foundation developers and researchers closely. So, like, basically, the the kind of the de jure question of you know like who is on what kind of payroll, and the de facto question of you know like who's a core member of the team, whatever the team is, often end up diverging quite a lot, and that's something we try hard to respect. Uh, let's talk about privacy and other the areas mm -hmm. we're focusing on. Um, the last Ethereum release had some pre-compiled zero knowledge primitives, and it was a uh, which is the kind of mind bending cryptography that Zcash, for instance, uses to shield the sender, the receiver, and the amount of a transaction um, from other eyes, even though it's all publicly verified and guaranteed on a blockchain. And are you moving more in that direction? And, and um, absolutely, yeah. Um, so, first of all, so what we did um, last year in uh, October is we released a update called by ZNTM that, you know, uh, uh, as I just said, um, um, opened up these um, um, these um, elliptic curve mathematic operations that basically optimize the math behind uh, all sorts of uh, privacy preserving cryptographic and zero knowledge proof constructions. And there are already projects that are starting to use them to build various kinds of privacy preserving applications, right? Like, I know what, there was one person in the community that was building a yeah, ring signature mixing contract. There was one guy, I forget, like Barry Whitehead or something, I don't even know who he actually is in person, who had just um, released something on Reddit about a month ago where he was like, oh, look, I, I used uh, the ZK snark function of pre compiles in Ethereum and Zocrates to build a uh, zero-knowledge zero shielded token, and it's already running on the test net, and theoretically it could run on the mainnet tomorrow. So, like, those kinds of signs are always really encouraging to see. In the longer term, I think our kind of privacy roadmap has a few parts to it. One of them is just kind of raw virtual machine optimization, because the problem is basically that the virtual machine as it exists today is totally not optimized for cryptography. And if we want, like, if the virtual machine is faster, then that means that more kinds of cryptographic primitives can be implemented, right? Like the current VM can be good for certain kinds of 256-bit stuff, but there is a much more wider space of things that it's not still not really performing well in right now, but we have like, efforts like WebAssembly and so forth to try to really improve on that. Um, a second one is um, kind of participating in and supporting the uh, development of zero knowledge uh, approved technologies. So including kind of like the tooling around Snark, so like we supported Socrates, um, including development around Stark, so like I personally have written some of those uh, Stark tutorials and we plan to be doing uh, much more with Starks in the future. Um, trying to kind of see you know, like what would it take to actually make the Ethereum blockchain be friendly to Starks. So that includes, uh, for example, like supporting finite field operations and other things involved in, like, star in uh, Stark verification. Looking at much more optimized hash functions. So all of the kind of like te technological building blocks that make it easier to build 
the zero knowledge preserving, uh, uh, privacy preserving schemes on top of the Ethereum blockchain. And then a third part of the research is probably that we haven't started yet, but we want to start in is looking at uh, kind of computing models that can be built on top of Ethereum and how the Ethereum base layer could be kind of modified to make it easier to build uh, more kind of well-designed programming abstractions for privacy on top. So that includes uh, zero knowledge encrypted smart contracts, it includes all of these privacy preserving tokens. Like basically how do we make it so that these things aren't kind of like clumsy one-offs that can't really talk to each other and have more, have a kind of privacy preserving smart contract ecosystem that's as friendly to interact with as the existing totally not privacy preserving smart contract ecosystem. So privacy preservation is a complex topic. I mean, Zcash and Monero are kind of banned in Japan right now. The Secret Service recently expressed concern about Zcash. Are you concerned that this is going to attract uh, kind of stern regulatory attention somewhere down the road? Um, I mean, I'm sure it'll happen, though at the same time, I think it's important to uh, kind of keep in mind that like, in a lot of these cases, and you know, like in the case of Ethereum as well, like, these are general purpose technologies. And they can be used, uh, like definitely not just by criminals. They can be used, like first of all, by ordinary people just trying to hide the uh, or protect the privacy of their payments. They can be used by enterprises who need the privacy features to satisfy regulatory requirements. Some ironically enough, they are needed. Um, and they can be used um, by um, like various kinds of like um, applications and constructions on the blockchain to try to uh, minimize uh, front running and market manipulation. Um, they can be used um, to uh, create, like, uh, to improve uh, various kinds of mechanisms like auctions because the uh, game theoretic proofs for why a lot of these mechanisms even work in the first place often has to do with uh, some kind of, uh, some mechanism that's capable of preserving privacy of a lot of the inputs. So there's a lot of kind of legitimate and a lot of perfectly tame uses for a lot of these technologies. And also a lot of these technologies aren't there just for privacy, they're also there for scalability, right? Like uh, more than half of the excitement in ZK Snarks and ZK Starks isn't even because of the privacy angle, it's because they allow you to prove arbitrarily complex computations in a single proof that can be very compact and verified in a few milliseconds. So I, you know, I do hope that you know like people see this kind of like this uh, much wider array of uh, general purpose applications for private for uh, privacy technologies. You know, like both in systems like Zcash and you know in the you know, more general purpose of the, um, array of Ethereum applications and so forth. So I mean, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it seems like that at some point someone's going to mm -hmm. use Ethereum for something which is perceived as nefarious. So I okay. So it. here's my argument, right? I agree that this exists. I actually disagree that we're, that we're going to marginally contribute to as much. And the reason is that, like, the, you know, like realistically, the dark net markets are already using Monero. So there's not much that we can do to, need to kind of like make the, the, uh, the state of affairs from you know, that standpoint uh, kind of like larger than it already is. But on the other hand, you know, if we yeah, continue working on usability and if we continue working on the kind of like, quality and security of these technologies, then we get the benefit that the technologies become you know, more ready and accessible for uh, use by regular people for uh, privacy and security applications. And, uh, and if like some knee-jerk regulator comes to you and wants to raise your hard forks and says, we have this thing we need you to fix, we see you can fix it, do you think you'll be able to talk them into seeing sense or do you think there'll be a, something to stand so up? First, so I expect that the probability of like, regulatory responses that try to target blockchains themselves to be fairly low, um, basically because it's like, that's not the 80-20, right? The 80-20 is basically is just banning exchanges. So if they have problems, they'll ban exchanges first. And that's, like the thing with developers is, right, that we're, we're fairly fungible people, you know, like we can kind of, you know, if like one developer goes down, someone else can keep on developing. If someone puts a gun to my head and tells me to write a hard fork patch, I will definitely write a hard, hard fork patch. I will write the GitHub issue, I will write up the code, I will publish it, I will do everything they say. Um, if I do, if I um, pub, um, do this and I publish a, a, a hard work patch to delete um, file a, a bunch of accounts, um, how many people here would be willing to download and install the update and switch to that chain? I see relatively few raised hands. <laughs> this is called decentralization. Um, so, Uh, let's go into something a little more fun. Sure. There's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't really like the 
you know, I was forced to write hardcore patches like that point as much as I'm sure I'd oblige if people ask. Yeah, I couldn't know what the zip looks intelligent. There's a lot of buzz about tokens for gaming and virtual collectibles, um, CryptoKitties being the most obvious example. So first I have to ask, mm -hmm. do you personally own any CryptoKitties? Mm, I think like two people gave me a couple of CryptoKitties and I haven't really looked at them since, but you know, they're around. Um, <laughs> There's also buzz about tokens being used for like in-game items for video games. Like, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely kind of excited to see that there is some interest in that kind of ecosystem. Um, hmm. I'll admit to kind of not being immersed enough in the collectible game world to really understand uh, to kind of understand the psychology of it well. So it's just because of that, it's kind of hard for me to make predictions. Um, like, I get that there's a lot of people that wants to be able to trade various kinds of in-game assets. Um, at the same time, I know that, like, back in my days playing World of Warcraft, like, the, um, like, Blizzard and the Warcraft, World of Warcraft community were very heavily against kind of allowing real money trade, and they were in favor of, like, persecuting it as much as possible, basically because they, uh, like the idea that World of Warcraft was this kind of neutral playground where you know you can't just easily get ahead by throwing a bunch of money at the problem. And though I do know know that like they more recently they've kind of given up on that more and more. Um, I mean, like basically the problem like I yeah, I do kind of worry about this uh, intersection of like basically how efficient markets end up interacting with, you know, the psychology of fun, which often inherently ends up involving the psychology of challenge, and how if it's not really that, ch like, if you can just dodge the challenge by paying $245 to a, gu a guy who runs a, a, a human farm in, like, India or China or wherever they're located these days, then, you know, I don't know, like, clearly there's a bunch of complex issues, and I'm kind of looking forward to um, from an observer's point of view, see, uh, seeing how that aspect happens. Though, like, in the context of, like, asset tradability actually happening, I do think that it happening on a blockchain is a great idea, because, um, like, it does mean that it creates this more neutral playing ground where like, you don't need, like, you don't have centralized providers that end um, as much that end up kind of, like, um, taking over in the ecosystem as rent seekers. You don't, you have, much more interoperability, it becomes much easier for newer games to kind of plug themselves in. Um, it's, um, you know, you get uh, much, uh, you get a lot of the existing infrastructure that's been uh, created by the crypto community to facilitate trading. It's, um, it would be interesting to see what happens when a game server gets hacked for the first time and because it's running Plasma, everyone's Plasma clients just automatically um, notice that the Plasma uh, server is like starting to misbehave and just send their, transa their exit transactions onto the blockchain and you see this really wonderful big splat with a bunch of transaction fees. Um, like, it'll, it'll happen at some point, it'll just be again, interesting to see how it happens. And I mean, in general, it does seem like a good sort of next stage use case to bring the technology closer to the mainstream.